Welcome back to AV Tech Talks. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight is our 31st episode. We are doing an open forum discussion. We did this back in November, and it was like such a great hit. People really liked that they could ask any kind of question. So we thought we would bring this back and, and do another one of these. Uh, so I hope everybody brought their questions and uh, is prepared to uh, to wow us with something and try to stump us. Or if you have some kind of cool tip or trick, it would be great if you could share that with us. Let us know uh, you know, what you found uh, AV related. That would be cool. So that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, Chris, do you mind uh, going over the house rules real quick? Absolutely. We'll go over the house rules. I'm not going to share the slides. Just so you know, we go live every Monday night at 7 p.m. right here on Facebook. Uh, you have the link that Ed's about to post in the Facebook chat for our Zoom call. Uh, if you want to be part of the webinar and the crew here that loves to get together and shoot the crap and uh, annoy the hell out of each other, in my opinion. But, you know, hey, we all love each other. It's all good, right? Uh, due to the nature of streaming, obviously there's lag between everything that's going on, uh, anywhere between 15 to 30 seconds. So if you don't think we saw something that you put in chat or a question that you dropped, we will get to it. As with always tonight, we are not streaming a particular topic. This is all your forum and questions. So again, don't be afraid to ask them. We're not the smartest tool in the shed. We can't bring topics to you unless you bring them to us. Uh, with that, again, we don't know everything. This is a live Q&A session. Do not be afraid to ask your questions and get everything going, by the way. Yeah, let's let's, let's make it spicy tonight. Thanks, Chris. Um, I, I'm just letting everyone on Facebook see we have a, a packed panel. But Omar, do you want to uh, you want to talk about anything real quick to start us off? No, I just want to give a quick shout out to, to Facebook land tonight. We got Ireland, Ottawa in the house again, London, Florida, Vegas, Texas, Kansas City, and Sweden. If I missed anybody, I apologize for that. But again, I wanted to welcome everybody on Facebook uh, for being here with us tonight, uh, for, for joining us for an open forums. We're super excited about this because this is kind of how we started back in the day, right? Uh, between Ed, myself, and Chris, we, we started this almost a year ago as a, a discussion and then uh, started seeing what was going on in the world out there and seeing the training going on and, and we wanted to provide something better. I think we did it, but we, we still like this format. We like to bring it in and, and involve the community and the panel as much as, as always. Uh, and obviously everybody in Zoomland here with us, you know, a bunch of familiar faces. I got Justin Hermingas, I got John Ellison, and, you know, you guys have been here with us, Dave Note, Iris Hoff, Deza Cameron, who's actually going to be on with us on Wednesday as well on the podcast side. So I hope everybody looks forward for that. Adam Berlin, always a pleasure to see you. Nate Armstrong is also one of our uh, speakers as well. As, uh, on us, Justin Berlin is back as well. He did a great talk if you guys are interested in that. I see some new faces. Roscoe Jones is a new guy. Hey, welcome, welcome. Andy Broughton, thank you for being here so much. Andy, I just talked about you yesterday, man. That was it's good to see you. I got Nina in here as well. Always good to see Nina and Jeff Keeley as well. Good to see you. Brent, Ch Brent Chandler, always good to see you as well. Leland Best. And then a new face again is Benjamin. The, I can't say your last name, Ben. Antipit. Antipit. You'll get to know very quickly I'm horrible with last names. So Just that's names all in I got. General. Just names in general. True, true. Yeah, and first names, yeah. And first names, yes. <laughs> but you guys, the like you it's others not, it, it's, know it's already. It's Nat. Listen, we all know. I'm yeah, drink your it. bubbly over there. Drink your bubbly over there. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> and I'll kick it back to you so we can keep going here. Um, I, I, oh, sorry, I missed Chicago, New Orleans, Bay Area. Thanks, you guys, for being here. Ed, I'll let you kick it back out. Great. Well, thanks, Omar. Um, so are we seeing any, uh, I guess, any? we'll start with the panel. Is there anything that the panel uh, can kick us off with tonight? Somebody have a, an AV-related question. I know that some of you guys have been in office hours earlier today and you might be questioned out, um, but let's see if we can, uh, if I'm... somebody can spin it up for us. Uh, Andy Rotten. <laughs> I, guess I, oh, I, thought, that I thought that was a hand there. It, it was a hand, no, but uh, someone else is about to talk. I, I just want to quickly ask if anybody happens to know if there's such a thing as a DV driver for Mac OS, modern Mac OS, being a Firewire for an old DV cam, anybody know of a driver? It'll allow me to use the uh, old um, DV cam as a as a as a webcam. <laughs> mm. Mm. I I, yeah, I don't. I'm I don't aging know myself. I know. I don't know anything on the top of my head, so I'm out of that. What about on Facebook, Glenn? Does anybody out there know anything? Uh, Andy, I just got a question about that though. Are you doing it from? Uh, was it 400 to? 
Another. Yeah, I've got all the adapters. I've got the 400 to 800 to USB-C, all that stuff. Um, it just, you know, when I plugged it in my camera, it didn't, nothing happened on the, on, in the computer. So I assume it needs a driver or maybe it's just not supported. I don't know. It's not, not, not USB though. It's fireware. I, I, for some reason I'm thinking, man, I'm, you're really making me think hard and further back than I want to, but I was thinking there was something from Sony. Oh, like a piece okay. of software from Sony, but effectively to get that video in, since it's not UVC or anything USB based, um, Wow, that, that would, that's going way back. I have to think about that some more. <laughs> I did a little quick Google. So I just plugged it in now. I just did a quick Google search. I didn't find anything, but it's probably one of those things where it's a hidden. Somebody's got a hidden driver left over from what way other back out, when. what other outputs does it have? Does it have well HDMI? Too, it does have HDMI. I guess that's another way I could go. Well, uh, I, yeah, I just grab a Magewell and stick it yeah, in HDMI. I can say I, ju I just got it in the mail from Amazon. It's nineteen dollars. It's an HDMI to USB adapter. I have no idea. I haven't tested it at all, but I'll put the link in for nineteen bucks. It might work. We but just I bought did, all um, these other adapters. They cost me so much money. <laughs> <laughs> nineteen bucks though to go from three HDMI, adapters I needed to go yeah. FireWire to USB C. It's ridiculous. Yeah, we just did a, a job where we had to do eight. Um, calls to eight computers and, and feed them back, switch minuses to each one. Mm -hmm. And so I told uh, one of the guys, go on Amazon, buy, f pick out three cheap HDMI to USBs and buy five of each. And hopefully we'll get 10 that work. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, one, one brand did not work at all. But yeah, the brands that worked, they were uh, $15 and $13. That's so amazing. I just bought one myself. Cheap? Yeah, I just ordered it today. This one adapter is $60. Yeah. <laughs> Lars said he might have one on a zip drive or floppy drive disk over there for you. <laughs> yeah, I think I've got one on a, what were those things? Not on, on the on mag tape? Not on the big mag tapes? No. Oh. I've got a SideQuest drive. It's on. <laughs> now you're going. Oh, you got SideQuest it. drive, jeez. <laughs> hey, buddy, a jazz drive? Jazz drive. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Jazz drive array. You get four of them together, you get higher throughput. Oh, my gosh. Sorry, sorry to derail things. <laughs> if anybody <laughs> finds something, though, let me know. Uh, what, which was what was the camera that you're that, or the device you're using? What is it? It's um, what do you call these things? Mini DV, I guess they are. It's a Canon HDV. It's an H HD camera from way back when. Mm -hmm. But it uses the tapes. It uses the old uh, the mini yeah. mini DV tapes. If it has HDMI, just go that route. Okay, Ret return everything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's from Amazon. I can return it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's good, that's the easiest plan. Route. I don't waste my time with all this junk, right? Okay, thanks, everyone. Great. Next. And if if you have questions from Facebook, put them in the in the comments. Uh, if uh, you're here in the Zoom webinar, uh, throw your uh, questions in the Q and A feature, and uh, you have the ability to upvote them once we get some. So throw them on in there. Um, if there's anybody else who has uh, any cool little tips or tricks. I know, Jeff, I think you have something you were interested in uh, in talking about tonight. Well, if you want me to. Okay. I, I, would, I, would, love, I would love to hear about right. what you've got going on. I'm always intrigued well, when, you, when you talk. <laughs> well, let's just put it this way. Um, we're finally getting a small piece of the pie that's been a very hard piece to get working in, uh, in our normal, I guess we'd call it our normal workflow of sorts in the cloud, if you call that nor I call it normal now. But uh, one of the biggest things we've always been fighting is getting good contribution into that workflow, which means a switcher, a router, everything else that I need, graphics, everything else I have is in there, but good stable contributions. So Sienna and I have been working together and we have uh, come up with something I think that, that works. It's called the Unite module for their processing engine. So uh, if you want me to add, let me grab real quick uh, that, that one page so we don't have to clutter it up. Now, there is a reason that, uh, and I'll show you the reason. I'm gonna start off with a test screen first, and then I'll show you the real reason of why I have such a high resolution monitor. So hang on just a second. All right, chart, there we go. And I think we'll just go with just that screen and share it. All right. So you should see that, yes? Yes. Just a big big gray screen with Sienna in the middle. All right, so that's where we that's like the beginning. That's the starting point. Uh, 
we grab the modules and bring them over. So I'm just going to start off with the simple part of it. On the side, you can see all the different modules and all the different parts of the engine. Uh, we're going to grab the Sienna Link, and this is the Sienna Link Web, which is a brand new part, and then also Sienna Link Unite. So these two work together. The Unite is the contribution part, and there has a certain port, and then it also can have an access word or password. And then we have a volume level on it for the incoming. We can select currently right now 360p, 720p, or 1080p for the input. And then you could uh, also fix, fix the uh, frame sync to be what you need, 25, 2997, or 30, whoever uses that. The downlink port is actually what ma matches up with our Sienna link port over here. And this, this output here, if I was going to go into a switcher, which I'm about to show you that, or going into another module, this is full NDI out. So it comes up and then it's converted over to full NDI with audio. And then we would need to create a mix minus from that point if we were going to send it back to do this kind of thing, a panelist kind of thing. And then the Sienna link part here, this is the feedback that goes back. So this is your return video and you can change the bit rate on it too. This is not WebRTC, it is not SRT, it is Sienna's own protocols that they've built uh, using uh, WebSockets is part of what they're using, but there's some other stuff that I can't really say that's behind the scenes, but it works, which is pretty amazing. So um, latency-wise, less than SRT and right about the same as WebRTC. Sometimes it's even a little bit better. So I'm going to go over to our default where we had a test set up. So this is where we were going in to just do some basic testing. I have three modules of Unite coming in and I'm feeding the vision mixer and then I'm embedding and de-embedding audio. So I have audio has mix minus in this mixer. So it's only, a, it's a six input mixer, but we can do four contribution mix minuses. So that's where I was doing my mix minus to start with and just the testing part. Whenever you start up a test, um, let me go to the, the other page, but when you start up a test, it pops up, and this window probably did not show up, I bet. Whenever I pressed it, did a window show up? All right, not that I'm I could to, see. I'm going to have to change the share. Uh, let's see, share the whole screen. All right, and so there's sharing the, the whole screen. Can I stop you for a second? For those yep. who can't see those little boxes that Jeff's working around, if you go to the top under view options for the screen share, you can increase the size of the screen and grab it with your mouse and drag it around so you can keep up with them. So this pop-up box, you see that now though, right? Little white pop-up yes, box. Yes, we, okay. we see it now. So normally this is where we would actually be seeing, uh, I actually have too many modules open on that port. So I'm gonna go back to the big one, which I was telling you is a little bit tough. So this is this is the whole map right here. So this is why I have this big 4K monitor on my desk. So as you can see, there's 16 on the left side, 16 Unites coming in. Then I'm bringing them into a multi-viewer so that we can see them all. And then on the outputs are 16 outputs that are feeding the web links, as I showed you earlier, the Sienna Link webs, which is your return video coming back. And then here and the very bottom is the intercom module. And the intercom module is what's doing the mix minus part. So everybody can talk and listen at the same time without that great echo that we're so used to not wanting to hear. So let me see if I can get this one to pop up now. All right, there we go. So currently right now, I'm actually already logged in upstairs. So my, I have another monitor above me. And so on that monitor, you saw how fast uh, that popped in. So I have this screen here, which is, as you can see, the uh, desk right here pointing down. And then this is my iPhone here. I guess you can see that there. And then there's Doug. Doug, can you hear us? Wave if you can hear us, Doug. He probably doesn't have his ears on. But this is as, it, as easy as it is. So you grab the camera. I'll do, actually, I'm already Mr. on that Mr. Moment. Uh, let's see. How about, um, that's not going to do, this is my USB. I have four different devices coming in, as you can see. Let's try this one. And then I'm going to change the audio for something else. So I hit preview. It should engage. Oh. I'm in that module. Sorry, my bad there. 
So I'm gonna bounce down to a different different one. So each one of these has its own IP address. I'm sorry, its IP address is for what is the Sienna engine. So there's no turn server, there's no stun server like in, in uh, WebRTC implementations. So it's point to point with this engine, which means one, security is managed by you and your people. Uh, and then the other part is you're not having to, that latency involved with having to communicate and such. So let's try this guy here and there, and then I'll preview. And then it doesn't want to do it because I have that other window open, I guess. All right, I'll bring the other one down. This is where we end up. So we end up with a, the monitor over here, which as you can see, I just have that 16 output that's being fed over here. And then the actual monitor on the left side is the camera itself. And then if you wanted to kill your video, you've got an ability to kill your video or mute your mic, either one from there. So then this source, as you're seeing right here, is actually coming to my router on the cloud. And then also from that going into the actual system itself. So I have a full NDI source that I can sit there and mix and do whatever I want to make whatever I want after that. Hey, Jeff, quick question mm -hmm. on that Unite module. What's the bandwidth requirement for each caller that's coming in? It's it's variable. Um, on the far left side over here, you'll see where I actually have two, well, now actually one, two, three, four that are actually turned on, eight that are turned on. This 1080p is the one that's my primary camera up top. Yeah, this one up here, which is a 4K camera, and currently we're capped at 1080p. And then the next one is 720 and 720. So it's going to negotiate to to get as high as quality as you want it to be. The outs for the return side, I think we have those set. I'll look here in the middle. Yeah, it's set for a three megabit back. So it's somewhere between. I would say 1.5 at the lower side at 360p, and it is coded in there right now, so that's not a variable that we can choose. All you can do is choose the resolution itself. But Very it's cool. it's definitely gonna be more than the average. So think four or five megs for a 1080p at this end, at this time. But that is that is something that um, we we're talking about that uh, I personally, would like the granularity to get in there and kind of you know dial it up or down if necessary but as you well know 1080p and 720p can look great at, at lower bit rates but also at the same time what good is it to have a higher bit rate at a lower picture size like this it's not really necessarily going to make it i'm sorry saying this backwards a higher bit rate at a lower picture size so 720 versus a lower bit rate at 1080 which one would i prefer give me the 720 especially if you're doing panelist type things because you're getting a great picture that you could, you're could you going to cut down on anyway to frame and such. Well, All right, thanks. Appreciate so it. So the bigger part of this is, as you can see, I have 16 right here, right? So that's 16 in, 16 out. I could easily, out of what I'm running right now with eight running, I'm only running at about three cores out of 72. So scalability is the big part of it so the ability to add another frame with the same thing which i could easily just go to to frame over here and i could copy and then i'll export that frame and then import that frame and then i've got another 16 and then another 16 and that's just in this current condition the current versions that we're working with right now the biggest challenge is you probably you audio guys especially ed you'd understand this too is the mix minus that's the biggest challenge everywhere because everybody's audio has to go somewhere and then you have to create your mix minus and then every one of those audios has to end up going back at that point too. That, I just blew everybody's head. <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> that moment of silence that's, was, yeah, that's yeah, what that was. What are you feeding back to all those people? The multi-viewer? Right now it's a multi-viewer. Uh, do you see the router that I just dropped in? Yep. All right, so on the router here, I'll resize it so it's a little easier. So I have on the first of the, these 16, the first 16 outputs, the destination is the router. I have the multi-viewer patched on each one of those. And so I have all 16 of these are fed into the first 16 of these web 
uh, feeds that are going back to them. So the advantage of this is then anything I put in this router. So if I wanted guest one, which is uh, my current camera up here, to have guest two as a one-to-one, -one, I just have to route it like that. And then guest two, I want to have guest one, or it could be anything you create in the cloud that's uh, you know with a timer, with a multi-view, with a specific two-shot or whatever you want it to be. Can you tie that to salvos on your switcher? So like this right here. Yep. Yeah. So here's the multi 16 right now. So I'm going to flip that back. And now you notice it just changed. All the first 16 are all now set right back to the multi viewer. Yeah. I just did something with an E2 last week and uh, we had eight callers and I had it where it popped up a still graphic smile. You're live on individuals nice. every t time we took them full screen but then when we had the tin box up it showed them the tin box ah uh, uh, good idea so yeah. i was able, whenever i punched it automatically fed them back so they weren't seeing themselves backwards mm -hmm. uh full screen yeah yeah because it is definitely i mean there is latency granted there is latency but it is so fast um i mean you could tell any of us could definitely tell but it is so fast. It's it's not one of those things that if you see it in a multi-panel, it's not as bad. Yeah, the tin box was fine for people, yeah. but seeing themselves back right next to themselves if they had a oh, two box up, drive you crazy. And one, you know, when they leaned, they both leaned away from each other and in towards each other. It was really weird. Um, so we just fed them a graphic. That's so actually, that's that's a cool little work through, Dave. I, I like that a lot. Jeff, I think there's a question here from you from uh, Jonah on the Facebook side, which I think okay. you're the perfect man for this, right? Does anyone have experience running instances of vMix on AWS pros and cons? Yeah, uh, we were definitely doing that. Um, we we've had uh, I've set up a, several of our clients actually, or we're building that out for them. And because they don't have to get deep into the whole AWS thing and figure out the structure and figure out what works, uh, we figured that out already. So it's a little easier for us to implement that on their side. Um, the, there are some advantages and disadvantages of doing that. One is cost and scalability. You can manage that with the right tools and knowing what your shows are. Um, it does take a little bit more time because you're, you're always in the clock, I guess you would say. But right. it's definitely doable um, if you need some help reach out to me I'd be glad to help uh, the biggest the biggest challenge I think is is just getting your head around if you're doing all virtual events that are callers in and things like that it's really perfect for that because you don't have to worry about you know video coming from a site or something of that nature but uh, video and audio from a site that's that's a little more challenging but whenever you're just having people dial in and they could use vmix call um, the perfect, the perfect, I guess you would call it, um, the perfect combination is something like the Sienna Cloud with, uh, or the Sienna Engine with those switchers on the backside. And, that, and we've actually, Drone Racing League is one of our clients uh, that we built out their complete, helped them build out their whole complete uh, workflow. And it was live to NBC, NBC SN and NBC itself. I actually own the Peacock, which is pretty amazing that a complete virtual sporting event was switched virtually and then ended up on a terrestrial broadcast. Uh, hey, Jeff, while, before we get too far away from that screen share, uh, mm -hmm. Jesse Mills asked if we can take a look at that module doing the mix minuses. Sure, sure, sure. Right. I think that's a, a big, even in vMix, the, you know, the hard thing to wrap uh, your head around sometimes is the uh you know the audio let let me go back to one of the smaller ones uh it's a little easier to see and so it, they call it they call it intercom but it, it's i mean it's not technically intercom i guess it, in many ways it is but it's not um so this is the 16 module is here so it's 16 in 16 out this is the a, a channel module so think of this as one pl it, and that's how you have to think. So it's not creating eight different PLs. It's just one PL. So you bring audio in, and for in this instance, I'm bringing audio in via, via an NDI source. So I'm bringing audio in. I'm going into this module. So this guy here, I don't want to have in the ears of, or I don't want to have him in the same ears as this guy over here. So as I draw those in, this guy, will be heard on two through eight. 
this guy here will only hear two through eight. So that's that's how the mix minus part works. There is a gate compressor that, that could be engaged on this module, uh, and there's no settings or anything. Like that. It's just a way to help clean up some of the, the lower audio that may not be there. Um, but this is that's a very effective and very simple way of doing a mix minus. But it, but it is using either NDI audio or if you're on premise with one of their systems, you can do Dante over AES67, which is quite handy. Um, we do have one of our those in our trucks. And then the other side of it too would be uh, Reaper. If you have the ability to strip audio and send it to Reaper, you can use Reaper audio in this. And oh, fourth, fourth one, Mumble. Uh, so those uh, gamers, Brody, you, you know about that, right? The, the Mumble thing was like way before this whole uh, wonderful stuff that we're spending a lot of time on now is. Yeah. Um, but Mumble is a very clean audio, basically audio only server. It was well before Discord kind of got into the game. And so uh, Mumble, you could tie it, and it actually has a Mumble engine and then it built into it on this server. And then you just tie that audio into one of the others, and then you've got audio uh, adjustments like threshold and hold time, which is like a gate compressor and such. So for, for guys that have an Aldante workflow, you know, mm -hmm. sound centric guys, Studio Technologies makes us, I think it's a single rack space unit that does something very similar. So you just route and patch your Dante sources in and out mm -hmm. of it, and it subtracts that one feed off of yep. each one. It's their intercom module. The, and also, I found something too, Dave, if, if you need ever need that and you want to get really deep, is a Symmetrix Radius, which you could pick those up on eBay. It's, so it's a DSP, but you could build that out and actually have more power because it actually has more channels and it's way cheaper. So that's an analog thing with... Uh with no, uh, it, Phoenix it has connectors? Dante in it. Yeah, it has Phoenix oh, on the back. Dante. But it has yeah. Dante. It's two channels, that are two, it has a primary and a backup of, of Dante. So it's got a redundant feed in it. Oh, it's phenomenal. Oh, it's got don't, all the, don't tell anybody yeah, all the effects stuff too. That's cool and delay. Yeah, Actually, so you can go fun. in and just build exactly what, this is what I did for uh, Doug that was on here earlier. And uh, it solved all the, because he was, uh, we built out a completely Dante uh, intercom system for him, along with the announcers, boxes and everything like that. And I love Dante. It's all uh, we use everywhere on our own site. But that was a huge thing was finding that DS, DSP. So you could do those mixed minuses. Otherwise, otherwise, you end up with half your board being chewed up. And like I'd end up with my TF, half of it, with more than half of it on my TF was being chewed up by that because I haven't got the QL5 like Ed yet. <laughs> yeah, I've got a client who um, has a PM7 and uh, they wanted it on a show on the road, but they had to put it back in their studio for a Zoom meeting and send out the CL5 because it didn't have enough outs, you yeah. know, to do yep. all the mixed minuses. Yeah. Justin, you have something you want to add? Oh, no, I didn't want to sidetrack, but I had to throw out another thumbs up to Dave mention the Studio Tech uh, intercom engine, which is, it's more than just an intercom engine. It's a hell of a uh, Dante Swiss Army knife, because mm -hmm. you can also use it as a summing mixer. And one of the things I love about they have what they call a pass-through mode, which you can actually take incoming Dante streams and rebundle them. So if you're wondering, worrying about how many flows you're running, running out of output or input flows it's a great tool to rebundle those too so it's really a great swiss army knife in addition to just doing intercom i feel like i got i gotta make guys i feel like this is the ed show tonight I, I, he's the audio guru here <laughs> these are all audio we're having an audio conversation here well it started with with jeff's cloud video stuff and uh and, uh, Jess, uh, Jesse's the one who brought us into asking about the mix minus, and then uh, Roscoe. What was what were you saying in the chat here? So when you showed that Jeff was that mix minus eight, then when you said one half of them talks to the other half, if you had all sixteen of those inputs populated, they would only be listening. They would be mix minus themselves plus seven other people. Correct? Is that what I got out of that? Jeff, you're muted. The smaller module was an eight that I showed you. But in the larger module, you know, let me pull it up. It would be 16. It would be 16. So then it's one, and then you're listening to 15, and then you just move down or up, whichever way you look at it to match Oh, up. but you are getting all other 15. Yep. Okay, got yep. it. Just want to make that clear. In, in this current 
condition. Got it. Uh, Thank you. There, there is another way of doing it with um, Ordor or Harrison's, um, what is it, Mix 32, that you could actually do 128 uh, mixes out. So it is all ver it's a virtual piece of software. I, I kept clicking. I was just like, it's got to be an end somewhere, right? <laughs> and, and I ended up at 128 mixes. And then I was like, okay. That's a good place to start. <laughs> that's that's beyond Dante. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's you have to have access to this special plugin. Uh, it's a VSC plugin now. Uh, they also wrote it for their door. Uh, Har Harrison is the commercial. Uh, uh, basically, they license our door, and so our door is um, uh, it's French, I guess, I'm, something from uh, in England or somewhere over there that that uh, they did. Um, a license OEM to Harrison. Harrison's got nice little, it looks like an audio board. It's got knobs and stuff where our doors kind of like sliders and it's all, I don't know, it's too funky for me even. So I, I went with the Harrison and um, it's a VSD plugin from VizRT slash NewTek. And so it does, what it does is it embeds NDI audio or de embeds NDI audio. So you put that in on each one of the strips. So each channel fader take in whatever NDI source you want that strips off the, and you tell it what channels you want out of that NDI because NDI could actually have 8, 16, it's actually unlimited, but you could have different channel numbers that you would pull off. So you would strip which channels you want out of that, that NDI video feed, put that in your fader, and then you would then go out to a mix and create your mix minus off of how many you need. Yeah. But just funny, we were just talking about all the little adapters and things you have to buy over the years. And <laughs> it's just it's software. all in software. <laughs> yep. Now it's all just a piece of software. But that's the biggest challenge right now is once you, making this scalable so that you could have uh so we don't now we actually have over sixteen people on, or so we have seventeen people on right now. So if that was the case, I would have to figure out something to do with one more channel. Oh, now we got eighteen. Thanks. And and the total pipe you'd need to go up and down to talk to it. Pipe. Fiber. One make one gig up and down, you'd be a piece of cake this, talking to it. This is in Amazon. Right. Okay. So, and audio is Jeff small. Does, Jeff doesn't operate outside the cloud. Come on now. That's I, yeah, yeah, I but, did. I did the whole I, I but the did. rest of the you world has to, the rest of the world has to get the Amazon through oh, something. No. Oh, but that's but that's one feed. That's yeah. one feed. And then it's yeah. one, this is the same, it's the same, that concept part is the same as what we're looking at right here on Zoom. So okay. Zoom is doing, uh, it's 3.5, roughly 3.5 megabits going up, 3.5 coming back. But it's compositing it all down. So it's, whether you're sending them something full screen or you're sending them a multi-view like this, it's still going to end up being around that same amount. So yeah, if for the, the contributor side, it's not much, not much at all. That's Matter of really fact, my cool. phone's my phone that's linked up right now. That has been for about the last couple of hours. Battery's about to dead die. That's the one thing. Of course, you know you do any kind of heavy video stuff, it's it's going fast. Uh, but my phone is uh, on Wi-Fi. No, it's not even on Wi-Fi. It's on it's on the cellular right now, and so I haven't had any any hiccups or anything with it. I'm really I'm really happy that it's headed down this route. But I can envision a way of making it easier for people to get in. Not an app. Yeah, this is all Chrome. This is strictly just a link. You click on it, you open it up, turn on. You have to allow your your microphone and speaker, or uh, microphone and headphones, or, or whatever you're listening to, uh, camera and microphone stuff. That's it, and then it just works, which is what we all dreamed about, right? I just keep feeling like I've walked into the wizard chamber, and you keep pulling the curtain back, and there's <laughs> a more, and there's more, and there's more. Yo, he's That's Mary it. Poppins. His bag is infinitely deep, and he just keeps pulling more tricks out of the bag as he goes. That's a better analogy. Very good. He, the one I've thing, never the been one accused thing, of flying around with an umbrella. I'm sorry. The so one thing with cloud service that you got to remember is cloud service is infinite. So the, Very much. it's it, it's going to be as much as you can compile on it, as long as you can handle the downstream from the cloud server to produce everything that's going out. So it's an infinite source that you're using. So you're talking about all this, even with video or anything that you're using to upload to the cloud and download from the cloud, it's it's only a matter of how much you can handle at your, ba at your station to be able to move all this stuff. So he's literally just, like I said, Mary Poppins, he opens a bag and says, 4K for you, 4K for you, 4K for you. And when you got 10 gigs, it really don't matter. 
<clears throat> so I well, do have fiber here at the office, but <laughs> I'm barely touching. I, I only have 200 up, I think, or 250 up. Jeff, have you had to down. use redundant operators yet, or have you for anything? Mm -hmm. Where you? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You just Absolutely. automatically set that up. Yeah, yeah. As far as operators, as far as the switching side. Yeah. Oh, or absolutely. Any side, or camera, yeah, yeah. Or whatever. Camera operators, anything. Yeah, every bit of that. It, it's more of a distributed workflow. Uh, Omar remembers it. It was more like it's like, hey, can you take over this camera for the next you know hour? Let me go grab some lunch. Then it's just a matter of click, click. You know, turn the dial over, grab the next camera, and that person has full control of it too. We have a lot of trust in our crew. Uh, you know, I haven't had to break any legs or anything like that. So uh, it's just a matter of making sure that you have people you can trust because so, they have ultimate control for just about everything. Do you prefer to bring them to a, a facility that you know well, or you trust that their own internet connection is good also? Um, we did run into a problem with that on this last show we did down in Florida. Uh, the internet, our replay guy was based out of Georgia, uh, Atlanta, outside Atlanta, and his internet did flake out a couple of times. And so he, now that was just, he was just doing control. The replay part was actually in the truck for us. So he was just controlling that truck uh, replay remotely. He wasn't actually carrying video to him and back. It was just a preview video that he needed to be able to control it, which was the, the interface itself. Uh, but, you know, other than that, couple two little hiccups we ran live on uh, tennis channel and worldwide tv feed for 10 days so it's just a matter of juggling around the people and i'll, I'll throw out here too we also had an it guy on the, on that particular show and most things that came up that we solved no one knew about it but us because jeff you know the screens you're looking at he's monitoring all these feeds and as soon as he sees a blip call them up or not call them up, but we were on comms hey go check this out real quick go out there look at it do something in the computer real quick the it guy and then oh, okay it's done and no one would know but us in, in the truck because we saw it before it even became an issue i think yeah. uh i think justin Hermanghouse, you have some experience doing production it what's that like uh you know the position that omar was just kind of talking about well, I mean, I think Omar nailed it. Your job is to be there and catch the problems before they go to air. Um, it's also a lot, I do a lot of stuff that's bonded cellular based where, you know, you are watching your bandwidths and your rates. So it's a lot of throttling feeds up and feeds down so that what's going to air, you're pushing the quality and what isn't. So there's a lot of sort of uh, QA chasing of that. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that some some of some of, I I, re, I don't remember the exact what went down. Maybe Jeff has a better memory, but I, we ended up troubleshooting something, and it ended up being not us at all. It ended up being our connection to I forget who the service provider was, but theirs was bad, and they had to bring a guy out there because um, they were uh, I think they were compressing they were not compressing us they were um, uh, what's the word throttling throttling yeah they were throttling us at some point and our, our internet was just going down and we we were trying we thought it was us for a while um we didn't have any problems out to the world but you we could see the a difference and they're having to call a guy out there to really kind of look at it and it ended up being the service the whole time they were throttling us and they're like they didn't quite it was weird because they installed it just for the scenario but they were like what do you mean you guys don't have enough like <laughs> oh, I, I, yeah. Jeff was telling me about this the other yeah, night. It yeah, it was it was that. Oh, I need. I told him it's like I need a hundred by hundred line, and that's what I that's was in the contract and everything. I need a hundred by hundred line. We could do everything we need to do well within that. I only using about sixty, but I needed one line that was a hundred by hundred. So they showed up with four modems at thirty each, and he's like, "Well, that's more than a hundred. Um, like that's not how it works, Mister IT from Comcast." <laughs> That's just not how it works. So we were able to make it work. We split apart encoders and, and we, we did a load balancing uh, act. Normally we do all that load balancing in our gear and in our actual, um, our actual router control and gateway and everything. But we had to just basically do it the old fashioned way. And just, you know, I, I like to have that line and then it was going to be a primary and a backup and then we have fell over, but it was just like, Oh, which modem are we on? And then where is it plugged in and where is it routed? But that was, yeah, they can't do math. Apparently. So Jeff, I mean, this is, this is all super interesting. And I think, uh, because I, I'm noticing the time, uh, I think it just means that we have to get you on another episode. You know, you've, you, you've been, a, you're a two timer. I don't think we've had anyone else, uh, as a guest twice yet. 
But uh, you might have to be the the three peat. You know, we'll have to bring you back. Uh, I, anytime. I, I love talking cloud and everything we're doing. I do want to invite everybody though. Is um, hit me. I guess we'll. I'll let Ed send out an email with this invitation. But I need to break this, so I need to put in like a hundred, two hundred callers, and uh, get get to the breaking point. Right now, this server and this configuration, by doing the math, we should be able to support about 150, maybe maybe 200 callers. And that's phenomenal growth. So Jeff, just thinking off the top of my head, why don't we do this? Uh, we will create a channel on the Discord that's specific for this for you. And I'm putting the Discord link in the, uh, the chats right now. So if you're not already on our Discord, you can join our Discord server. Uh, that uh, link does not expire. So if you're watching this as replay, you can get in there. We may not have Jeff's test, depending on when you watch this, available still, but uh, at least you'll be able to get in and see the stuff we have going on. And we'll see if our community can break it. If, uh, uh, if anyone can break something, I'm convinced our people can do it. So, AV people could definitely do it, yep. <laughs> so we will, we will try. Uh, oh, it's already added. It's called Jeff, Jeff's Test Breaker. Awesome. Great. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, I do want to get back to uh, some of our questions. We had a couple that came in. Um, from earlier, Mike Grayeb had uh, asked, does that HDMI to USB adapter replace a capture card? Sorry, I caught the end of that conversation. So was that, I think that was the one that Roscoe maybe had. Uh, yeah, Roscoe answered yeah. that one too I, and said I, I it have, does. I have no testing on it. That's why I say I just got it. It just literally came in yesterday. So I can't guarantee that it does anything. I put in the one that, uh, the nicer one that we used for a week. So it, it's, it was recommended to me that it does work and it's Russian. And anyways, so. also, oh, Jeff, okay. uh, real quick, mumble is still a thing, by the way. So, it's, so used, Chris, it's used in very limited game sources and actually as companion backlog chats for certain games. Like for instance, among us, which is a really popular game right now, they're using it to create proximity chats that's what the proximity chat server uses is Mumble as its backend. Then there's RP servers for role-playing games like GTA and Seven Days to Die and things like that that create their own in-game backend chats through Mumble. So Mumble is still used. Is so Chris just for AOL users and MySpace users? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> just as we're on the topic of it, you want to explain to the community out there who might not know what it is, okay, what exactly so is Mumble? Mumble? Mumble is a low-latency very actually quite decent quality voice server that you can modify and you can share over IP. Um, so what you can do is you can send people IP links to your mumble chat. They can only access it and you create an, a server that only certain people can be on and communicate on kind of like discord, just a little bit more complex to set up and get running. It, it's an audio version of discord audio. Uh, right. I, I would assume so, but Diza, you said you had a question. And you're muted. <laughs> I call a guy up. Sorry, I'm trying to sign up for Discord over here. Um, yeah, I'm really interested to to hear about the Zoom updates. Specifically, the one I'm interested in is the the video capabilities. I know you guys have probably already tested it all out and uh, broke it. Maybe no. Ben Benjamin like already had answers. Go ahead, man. Take the floor. <laughs> He's like. He's like, I got, it, I got it. I know. I'm off gotcha. the ground. I'll see. Maybe John, you can back me up if I if I mess this one up. But uh, the uh, as best we can tell, we've been discussing it on the Office Hours Discord a little bit, and uh, the big one is this video sharing. Um, aside from blurred backgrounds, which by the way just seems super exciting, um, and the the video sharing seems like it would be great in theory. And the support page, which we can drop in maybe the Facebook chat, is um, up and running, but. Uh, Nobody has yet been able to find the feature in a production version of the app. Um, some folks with a pre-production version say it exists and the function, the feature works, but in the production version, it's not present. So we'll have to wait for the next update, as best I can tell. So wasn't there? Wasn't Frank there? Posted uh, a link over here. It looks like Frank seems to know a little bit about it. <laughs> wasn't there another update too about you can con now the host can control the view of the attendee on, on the other end. Yeah, come Indeed, on today. there was that was for for webinars. Yeah, yeah, on the webinar side. So now, so now, as of February first, if you do an update, the host of the can can control whether you see the gallery view or the speaker view 
which for what we do is obviously phenomenal because that's something we need to control all the time. And usually it's more of like a verbal, hey, please be in these settings so that you can see the correct thing. Because if not, you're going to see what you're not supposed to see. Yeah, so Dorian, already in, in webinar, versus Kelly. speaking about that, uh, so they, they moved where you can find, in, if you're in webinar, uh, the follow host view versus speaker versus gallery for the attendees of a webinar. So uh, typically I run in the follow host view for our uh, viewers, but I have the ability to change that now in a much easier place. It used to be you had to go into the participants window and it was kind of buried, but now I can switch as I just did to the gallery for our uh, people on webinar to speaker and then to follow hosts view. And then if I switch my view between gallery and speaker, you guys get all that. So. That's what I just did for the people who are watching as attendees on the webinar. And if you missed that on Facebook, then you'll just have to join us on our webinar so you can see those interesting things happen sometimes. Um, one thing uh, while we're talking about webinar and while we're talking about this, it just happens. And I don't think Disa actually knew that next week our topic is uh, for episode 32 is Zoom meetings, tip, tricks and new feature review. So that just got uh, published today. We're welcoming back Jeff Widgren next week. Uh, so I will get those links in the uh, in the chats for the event page, so you can you can register. I'm saying I gotta tune in next week to find out. I am saying yes. That's what I'm, <laughs> exactly what I'm saying. Um, uh, or you can join us on the Zoom Test Kitchen uh, tomorrow, which is Tuesday. That happens at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's a, a Facebook group you can find. Uh, I'll get a link to that as well. Uh, we meet Tuesdays and Fridays. I'm an admin on that group, and we will be looking at some of the new features tomorrow and testing them out so that uh, we're all ready to show them off to you guys next week. Me and Jeff. Jeff uh, is the founder of the Zoom Test Kitchen. Uh, both of us are also um, moderators on uh, Masters of Zoom. So there's lots of Zoom things that happen between Jeff and I. Um, but speaking of webinars, uh, we did say, we did preface some things that we have an announcement to make about webinars. So starting next week, we are actually going to be moving our webinar from the account that we're currently on today to uh, a different account. Thanks to uh, the continued support of the DVE store, we will be migrating to a full 1080p webinar account where our attendees will get 1080p. Uh, instead of what they're getting now currently, which is the normal 360p on Zoom. So all of those demos that we've done in the past uh, where we've shown software and things were hard to read, uh, that will not be the case anymore. You'll be able to see things nice and clear, even when someone brings in a desktop share as a virtual camera. Uh, so we're very excited about it. I'm going to get the link right now where you can register. And for the people who are already registered for our webinar, I'm going to be sending it. You'll be getting an email, a new registration email. I'm trying to make it as seamless as possible, but bear with us in case you do not um, get it right away. We will make sure that everybody gets migrated over from the current webinar to the new webinar. So thank you to the DVE store, uh, dvestore.com. Check them out. And uh, we're super happy to have 1080p. It's going to be a whole new world. A whole new world. <laughs> Oh, I was thinking it, man. I just wasn't going to do it. So props to you. Props to you. I'm, and for everybody in Facebook land right now, I see this 3070 viewing us. Uh, please go ahead and ask your questions in the comment. We'll answer the best we can or interact the best we can. We'll, we'll, we'll bring it up as quickly as we can. Um, I see there's a lot of you. So I, I'm letting anybody who's new to the show, this is an open forum. Um, usually we do a, like a demo or a live show and tell. Uh, we call these our hard skill sets and we, we do a whole kind of talk about it and we, we let you guys ask questions so that you lead the conversation. Um, this isn't us talking to you. It's an interactive both way thing. So the more you guys talk to us, the, the, the further we can dive into things, but we only have two hours. So ask your questions now, as I say that there's questions coming in. So I'll start getting those in the queue for us to come back on and leaving. I see your hand up. I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, I thought since you brought up Zoom, I'd throw a little tip out there before next week shows up. Uh, I'm just going to throw this onto the screen so you guys can all see it. I came across this last night while I was playing on the internet. I've been looking for a good MIDI, MIDI controller because I use I don't have a Stream Deck, and I've been using the Stream Deck, nah, Stream Deck app, say that three times fast, on my cell phone, but it doesn't always work right. So I went and checked out this little app called Matrix, and this app 
helped me create something that I thought was kind of cool and you guys might like it. And it, as soon as it loads up here in just a second, you'll see the graphics, hopefully. I was not gonna go through there. All right, it's not gonna work, there, there, there it goes. I'm loading this up on Mirroring 360, so it's an app that's actually receiving the signal from my cell phone. What you see there is a remote control for Zoom. So basically all of the shortcuts that you've ever seen on Zoom for Alt-M, Alt-A, Alt-C, Alt-T, I've built on little buttons on this Matrix app so that I can simply hold my cell phone here. And if I wanted to come up here and turn off my video, I turn off my video. How do you oh, link it to the meeting you're in? It's basically just running on the MIDI signal of the software running. Because the alt sequences in Zoom can be either local or global, you have to go into your keyboard shortcuts on Zoom, which are under the main menu that you pull up when you set your video or your audio. You'll see the keyboard shortcuts there on the list. There's a little checkbox off to the right that says global. And if you check that box, you can reach that sequence from anywhere on your screen. Doesn't mean your mouse has to, your mouse doesn't have to be inside Zoom for that sequence to work. So as long as you're broadcasting that control sequence or alt sequence, I should say, across to the software, it's gonna pick it up anywhere on the screen. So you have to be careful which ones you globally set. You don't wanna globally set an auto mute for everyone because if you were to do that, you could globally mute the entire Zoom from anywhere. That's one thing you have to watch for. You can so is also- So your, your phone emulating your keyboard then? Yeah, it's just cool. using the shortcut keys that are crossed right there. If you look on the screen, I could probably share, but all of you can go into your settings for your audio or video down below. And that menu pops up and under keyboard shortcuts, you'll see to the right, it says enable global shortcut. It'll be a little blue check mark if it's already enabled. So you have to be careful again, which ones you enable globally. But if by doing that, you can at least get a select set of commands onto a MIDI controller and be able to control your Zoom with a remote. Are you on Android or iPhone? This is an Android device. Matrix is available on the cloud. Now, I don't know if they have an iOS app for Matrix. So, and it's the nice thing about this, StreamYard's 25 or Stream Deck's $25 a year. This was five bucks one dime. So you do have to build out the app. Let me show you the app real quick. This is the interface. So basically what you get is what you see. It's this nice little, uh, if you guys can't see that, let's do this. Let me do a screen share for you real quick. This will be better quality. So this is the interface for Matrix. Now you can create a new template, but there's a lot of them already out there for these really cool player buttons. There's stuff out here for uh, Netflix remote. And when I saw this, I was like, wait a minute, Netflix remote. And then I saw somebody had made one for a Zoom meeting controller. So you can simply clone this onto this interface, save that deck to your own name that you'd like, add, it, add other pages to it if you wanted. And then for each button that you want to edit, you simply go to the button. You can change the appearance of it if you'd like and make it a visual toggle so it's on or off. And then you just add an action. So you simply go down to the action and add the control sequence by selecting a hot key action instead of a macro. And, or none, so it's gonna start out at none. You go to hotkey, and then when you click in here, you do an alt Y, it's gonna automatically accept the keystroke. And then you simply go ahead and save that with the name of the deck that you choose. Okay, so you wanna put a new name in there, and then save it, and you'll have another deck down here along the side. So what I did was I combined decks from all these flight simulators, and it made a really cool one for me to use. So they had all these buttons to play with from all over the place. And instead of creating the Zoom typical, I went down and created the Zoom X2, which allowed me to take this one. And if I wanted to clone it onto the screen, this is what I built. And then I went one further and made one for a tablet. So I'm looking at to try and get this one on an even bigger scale for like a 10 inch tablet so that you could put that up and control various aspects. I'm gonna try to connect this with OSC no guarantee to where we could actually select individuals from each frame of the Zoom grid view. Hey, so hey, Leland, kind of, does, yeah. can you, uh, can you share, can you share, like, you know, how you did the layout? Can you share that to other people? Like, can you do that? Yes, you can. You can simply come up here to the share screen and whatever load that you already have in there, for, for instance, will mm -hmm. go out to the network of other online templates that they have. So you can simply go out to their online site at matrix, uh, community matrix app.com and you can download their most popular apps. And the thing that's nice about these that have the buttons already preset for you, 
Once you download the deck, you simply go for where it's at in your download folder directory, right click that little icon that looks like the rest of them and click on import at the top of the menu. It'll import that file into the, the deck will get imported into, uh, where we go, right here. Oh, I lost my deck, hold on, where's my deck? All right, so right here, once I get in here, it'll tell you down the bottom, a little right uh, red box will show them, say your deck was imported. And then if I come down to the bottom, well, I'm not sure where that one ended up, but it's somewhere in there. Uh, it would be on this list of sides. So uh, let me see here. I just import it. But the other thing I wanted to point out, so basically once you import it, which it should have taken it and showed up on the side, um, you want to connect your device. Now, when you take the app, the first thing it's going to do is look for the software running on your machine. So it should simply auto connect. You shouldn't have to do anything but give permission on your computer for your phone or laptop or whatever device you want to connect to the screen. Because you could literally use a, I would think you could use a uh, touch screen laptop or any other tablet as well. I happen to have a tablet connected, but I just bought a tablet that doesn't seem to work. So I'm going to have to try a better brand of tablet. But I just thought I'd throw it out there. It's a neat thing to play with because all you have to do is drag these buttons off from one of the screens that already exist, set it onto the screen, put it wherever you want, doesn't matter. And if you don't like it there, you simply drag it up here, drop it in that little bar and it disappears. So Leon, what version of Android does it have to have? This one, I believe, has to have Android 5.0 or higher. I did find another one out there that's available. I may show, but I, I wasn't too impressed with it. That goes as low as like 1.2. Um, that would take old tablets into consideration, John, like you mentioned, so that people could use stuff that's just laying around the house that has no use anymore. Could be used as a controller device. So I'll be playing with it quite a bit and building out more of these just for fun. And I think if you get in there and download it, spend the five, the only reason you have to spend $5 is to get larger than this. If you just buy the, get the regular free app from Matrix, you will be able to do a phone remote for free. I simply paid the $5 so I could do the tablet app because in order to get an unlimited amount of grid spots, and there are some out there, you could just build a soundboard with this if you wanted to for any other purpose. It doesn't have to be a Zoom controller. You'd build a you know soundboard with the same size grid all the way across with labels for every sound that you wanted to put up. So, pretty cool toy to play with. Oh, cool, thanks for Very showing cool. us that, Leon. That, that does look pretty cool. We've dropped links to that. Omar dropped a link in the, in the chat so people can check that out. That does seem pretty... Uh, Pretty cool. Rocco DeSanti approves, says it looks pretty slick. So that's, uh, he likes uh, Lorian board, uh, which he says doesn't look as nice, but it'll do the same stuff for free. But I think that's that, that looks pretty slick and cool and simple to use. The um, thing I love about it, uh, to be honest, Ed, is that there's been a lot of people designing buttons for this to emulate switches and knobs and dials and things that can be uh, made to look like the switches are actually flipping up or down, depending on how you set the graphics or whether the lights, when you actually push a button, whether the light will come on or stay on or just simply come on as you push it. So there's a lot of different things you can do to play around with it. It's kind of cool. As you're pushing it, we were losing your video. Yeah, uh, that's it's actually, actually connected. Yeah, no, that's great. So then we could see what Now all we have to do is, as I say, Leah, now all you have to do is do it for the iPhone, right? Agreed. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think we, we lost, lost him. him. We lost you. He ran away. I messed the word iPhone to Leland and he disappears. He pressed the wrong <laughs> button. He muted himself there, it looks like. Yeah, he's muted himself. It's a curse of the iPhone. Did I mute myself again? Yeah, I actually flipped up when I flipped my hand to raise my hand. It put me up in the front position on the top corner of the screen with my hand up on right my screen you're... anyway and take it back off, it moves me back. <laughs> you saw control from Ed. Can I ask no, one more question to Leland? Yeah, it, go ahead. If, if a teacher had their own device, their own phone, and they walked in with it, if you open up all the global commands, potentially each teacher could walk in with their own custom layout of buttons on their own phone. And that because you've enabled them globally, as soon as they've connected that computer, I see this, John, are you listening there? Yeah, I'm listening, yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> you, you get where that goes? I Rather know, than but, that uh, little but, but six I have to get an screen. Android now. <laughs> That's okay. See, I was but thinking about that for a school setting too, where you just have a tablet because if the new circumstances, kids, you're trying to have them learn how to stream and everything, something like that that's inexpensive and easy and you can make it as simple as you need to for them to learn some 
stuff you, about how to make it work. You give the teacher the default, and then they can play all day and move exactly. the buttons where they want them. That's, right. that's what's really cool about it's that. It's the creative aspect about it that I love the most, and these are the kind of tools I'm always looking to find. Thank you, sir. I like it. I like it. So let me see what questions we got in the queue right now. I know there's a couple building up here. Uh, so Rocco asks, can you talk through what you need to qualify for a 1080 webinar account? Anybody want to take the lead on that? I I, like a lot of emails. Yeah. Dave, I know you have a Zoom room. You don't have a, do you have a 1080 webinar at this point? No, you don't. Okay. Um, so essentially you have to, before Zoom will even entertain the question of uh, increasing your resolution. And I see John smirking because he actually knows better than I do. Um, not, not smirking, uh, but the information is on the Zoom website, but go ahead. Right, exactly. Yeah, support uh, at Zoom is probably your best uh, insight to find it. But um, my understanding, I'll say, is you would need a business account with at least 10 or more um, users connected to that account. And you would have to plead your case as to you'd have to request it from support and plead a case as to why you would need a 1080p webinar account. And uh, they are not easy to get. I know very few people who have them. And I will say we are very fortunate that someone has uh, enjoyed our show enough to let us use one. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it at that um, unless, John, you have anything to add. All right. You know, go to the Zoom account. The Zoom wants to give everybody as much bandwidth as possible, I'm sure. First, I need, I'm not speaking officially for Zoom. I'm just a father. But, um, you know, they are increasing their bandwidth. As you may recall, when the, at the uh, COVID crisis hit, everything was down at the 360. Now, most of the people are getting 720. And there are lots of people who have the 1080 accounts. So Zoom has a a process for being qualified to ask for it and a way of requesting it. And people are getting them and, and more and more will get them as the bandwidth gets available. I think John, it's fair to say though, that more people have 1080p meeting accounts than you will see with 1080 webinar for attendee accounts. Is that? That is correct. Probably at this point. Right. And that's, I think that's specifically what the, yeah, that's specifically what Rocco was asking for the webinar it's a little more difficult because that's uh, you got to think of how much bandwidth that is. If you have hundreds and hundreds of people consuming a 1080p signal, that it, it's just an infrastructure thing. It, it's a lot of bandwidth, and we're all on Zoom all the time. I mean, I'm on Zoom all the time uh, now, so uh, Zoom's probably losing money hand over fist with just the amount of bandwidth that I'm consuming on a daily basis. Uh, imagine that times a thousand people watching a webinar. So uh, that's kind of where that's at. So let, let me uh, let me jump in here. I see Benjamin, your hands up. So you can go after this. And then after that, uh, Roscoe, was I correct that you wanted to speak as well? No? Okay, I so Benjamin. On the 1080p. Yeah, so I, I obtained 1080p uh, meetings for my school. And uh, my, my brief comment on that is um, if you have Zoom connections, you should bug them. And they seem to have some secret sauce internally. I have no uh, it, that and it seems like if you have a uh, if you make a logical case about some kind of usage beyond just I want my meetings to look prettier, um, some kind of like if you're a broadcaster, some kind of like I'm broadcasting to this large audience, and somebody said if you need the request somewhat urgently, sometimes that will help. But so we uh, we've got yeah we've gotten it through one of my clients for a show. It was it was but like Ed was saying, it was more of a pay thing for us. Um, we were, you know, one of the Fortune 500 companies and they, they made a phone call and within 24 hours, we had an HD account for the webinar and we probably never maxed out. We probably never had more than hundred people in the, in the meeting, to be honest. We did three shows a day for about six months, but never had more than hundred people. So whether 1080 was needed or not, I don't know, but the client definitely wanted it and they paid. So <laughs> right. I right. hope that answers your question. Uh, I don't know if that was the best of answers for, for, for what was out there, but there's other ones we got as well. Ed, I'll let you take the next one. Um, I think I think we skipped one earlier. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. From Lars Venson. Uh, he asked, uh, and he asked when we were talking, when Jeff was talking uh, puffy clouds. Uh, okay, let's get a little bit closer to the ground. Tips on where to uh, get good virtual sets for vMix out there. 
Does anybody have, uh, maybe Leland, because I know Leland, you're a big vMix guy. Where can people find great virtual sets? There are quite a few out there, but I will have to provide links because I don't think I have anything right in front of me. Honestly, if you go to any of the, and, and what is it, Envato, Engato, um, you can go to Video Blocks is another place that has a lot of virtual video sets, and they're really repetitive. I probably have a ton of them. If you just want a couple that you want to play with, let me know. I could probably shoot you one or two, um, depending on your color branding. Uh, but yeah, if you just head out to any of the video archive sites that you can get royalty-free video from, you'll usually find virtual videos that's there as well. And if anybody in the community has a link to somewhere that they're finding some great virtual sets, we'd love to, we'd love to hear it. Virtualsetworks.com. Yes, there you go. Thank Eric you, Pratt uh, runs that. I've known Eric since the play days. If for any, no, anybody knows play, it was uh, way back then with Kiki and, and the group and Paul. And uh, we met, back then and uh been friends for a long time since he runs uh, us broadcasts which is a distributor on the east coast and uh he has just a knack at getting the them to look right it is it is it's a skill set it is a hundred percent a skill set and uh he's really good at it he puts all the chroma in his panel work too doesn't he everything's already built into the element. Oh, you just open them and yeah you just tell him what you want whether you want it for a tricaster a v mix wire cast uh, or if you need to do it in, in after effects even so yeah you could just throw it in there and just go to town and start producing right away totally does forgot about that you and i are both working under does he ship set with, work, the, US with the silver ball do his sets have the silver ball silver ball the silver ball to show where all the lighting's coming from? Uh, not that I've seen. Okay. Uh, no, I don't, I don't believe. No, I don't believe I've ever seen that on any of his. Okay. Yeah, most of because it's not because the virtual sets in the that are being done in VMix are actually work differently than what are done in TriCaster. Uh, so you can't control the light per se. I know in TriCaster, I can't. But yeah, the silver ball just tells when you're lighting the person who's going to be in the foreground w to match the lighting of the virtual set. Gotcha, gotcha. That's, that's what the silver ball yeah, is. I've never for. seen a silver ball in his unless it's something new that I just haven't seen yet. But uh, yeah, I highly recommend his. This stuff. is an example here of what you would get as a virtual set. And I can't disclose the pricing on that in particular, of course. But the fact of the matter is, is they are constructed separately these are constructed for vmix like he said but what i was referring to are simple video backgrounds with chroma filled in on the background screens that you can replace in their background videos oh oh okay so you you were talking about a set that just you're when you say chroma you mean green screen so you you have something in the screen there that you bring in or something that is more of a i uh this is an overlay that you're just throwing over the top of so you have it as a uh, punch through like a a png with an alpha yeah, it was pretty much just a PNG with an alpha, or you can create a little video play with some glitter to it that looks like there's stuff going on in the background, fuzzy cameras flickering on and off or anything like that with GIFs, and then create a video playback with some green cutouts in there so that you can chroma those sections out or replace them with something else, or just leave them alpha like Jeff mentioned. And if you're a graphic designer, just create it in layers and build your own sets from scratch. It's not as, not as hard as you would think it is. Uh, to do, but um, so, so Roscoe, tell me a little bit more about these, these, this ball, this light ball, because it, it doesn't, I don't feel like that's a VMix thing. Like if you were talking Unreal Engine or Disguise, I'm following okay. you. Okay, two, two things. If I'm going to go out and shoot something, if I'm going to go out and just grab a, a virtual background that I want to use, I would actually take a physical silver ball, set it on a pole, like it looks like just like a monopod. And when I shoot the scene, I therefore can see where the lighting is coming from. That way, when I light the foreground element, it's going to match what's going on in the background. The light's going to come from the same direction. That's what that silver ball does. It, it shows me where the lights, what angles they're coming from. There's actually software that can analyze the ball and create. So let's say I'm making a virtual foreground person and match the background I created based on that silver ball. Got you. Got you. Okay. I'll, I'll, find, thinking... a video. I'll find a video or a reference for you. No, that's great. I love that. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm thinking like Vectorworks or Disguise where you have a ball, you know, that does the light, but I'm thinking, well, how is it really tracking all that stuff? So that was a much better explanation than what I was thinking in my brain. So thank you for that. Do, do we have any more questions in the queue? Let me go back to that page um, as I'm looking. 
Or right, John, go ahead while I look for that. John, I'll let you take the floor. Well, I, I was just going to add that, you know, as educators, there are a number of people who have virtual sets that give free sets of them to educators. Um, I think the big challenge is that getting good virtual sets are hard to come by. And like Roscoe was saying, getting to look right and light them right. I'm, I'm a firm believer if you're going to do a virtual set, try to make it work well. And a lot of the free ones, you, you sort of look like you've been thrown on to the uh, film at 11 News. But, you know, green screen lets you do all sorts of fun things. You know, I just could do green here now. So this is my little traveling green screen that I... <laughs> That's pretty awesome, John. That was that, awesome. That was I got I, I gotta I gotta applaud that. That was great. Uh, <laughs> I just sorry. like the fact some of them are considering lighting because a lot of them don't. They don't think about actually lighting the people or lighting the virtuals. And if your light color doesn't match, you look really really weird. Yeah, it's a, it's a flat background, and it just like your eye it just doesn't look right to people right. and they don't understand it and for students it becomes distracting absolutely you look like everyone with the virtual backdrop on zoom <laughs> yes <laughs> yes what, what are you uh what are you trying to say dave i feel, I feel a little attacked right now <laughs> you need to hold up your silver ball no. No, listen, <laughs> not to get the secret tighter, but Ed, you got the two lights coming in the back. It's shining, man. It's looking good. Yeah. It looks legit. I've been asked, my own father asked me if you were on a real set or not. So, you know, for guys who've been doing it for like 35 years, you tricked him into it. Uh, Dave, I, 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 wanted to go, I wanted to go back to the beginning real quick. And you had said at the start of, uh, start of this conversation about you, you had did the, uh, with an E2, this uh, smiley face to go live thing, was that a necessity from a client or something that you just thought of as an as a, a added feature that you kept hearing? Because, you know, for me who does this a lot too, I, I hear that a lot and it's it's always been like, well, that's what it is. I've never thought about improving that process. And it's like, you just said it and it's like, oh, that's, that's exactly the solve for that. Um, uh, I guess at the start of the pandemic, I was um, thinking about mixed minuses and, and thinking, why doesn't there a video version of that? And I wrote an article on LinkedIn about, I called them switch minuses. Maybe I coined the term, maybe I didn't. But, um, you know, every time I do something with multiple feeds like that, I'm always thinking, especially if there's latency involved, do we want to feed that back to the person? What do they want to see on their end? <laughs> And uh, that's why we bought all those $20 capture, you know, U HDMI to USBs. And we had eight machines up. Uh, one neat work. So we were able to feed them that so they didn't see themselves next to themselves 600 milliseconds behind. Um, and I imagine in, in vMix or other, you know, platforms, you're going to have a way bigger latency. So, um, yeah, the switch minus concept, but there's not a lot of hardware out there. I took took me uh, to do a tin box with three local stages in the studio and eight callers. I had 17 layers on an E2 and a maxed out an S3 expansion. So um, it was pretty, pretty crazy. And they I came up so. the, the same day and said, can we do um, 13 remote callers? Nope. We only have eight machines. <laughs> Tough. But, um, but one thing there we was learned. A tool you could say yes. <laughs> It's yeah, that, it's, it's coming. Yeah, and I said we could have said yes two days ago. Yeah, Zoom OSC. Yeah, um, absolutely. I said if this meeting was in a month, you might have a totally different way of you know of handling the whole thing. One thing we did that was neat on that um, was we had all the remote callers. We gave them the same link to a meeting, and then we set up eight breakout rooms, and then each machine was was they were all logged into one meeting but each machine was in a different breakout room. So everyone called in, we talked to them, we, um, you know, QC'd them, and then we pushed them to a breakout room that was assigned to their slot in the switcher. So that, um, you know, if they lost or dropped, we weren't having to run over to that machine. They just called back into the machine. Our machine was still tied in the meeting, you know, all at nine of them, eight plus the, the host, the guest host, and uh, they would show back up in his machine and he would go, oh, yeah, you're, you know, you're Sue. You go to number seven and just push him right back into the breakout. So that worked really well. 
Oh, th thanks for that feedback. So we got another question here on the Zoom side, and this one goes directly to Jeff. Uh, Jesse Mills says, Jeff mentioned TriCasters in his workflow. Are modern TriCasters ultra reliable? Any quirks and experience with the TriCaster Mini? I see Roscoe laughing over here. <laughs> the TriCaster Mini, um, the new 4K is actually a phenomenal piece of gear for the price point and what it can do with just, it's only IP. So you would have to have NDI converters on the backside. Uh, but by the time you do the the amount that you can do to it with those NDI converters, so it'd be dropping a spark at each location, you have a camera or have cameras that are NDI to start with, that all comes back over the ethernet back to the mini. It's amazingly, uh, it's amazing what you can get for bang for the buck. Is it the price point of a VMix? No. Is it as capable or is a VMix as this capable? It depends on which way you look at it in the workflow. Uh, but for us, short of a recent event that we were on that uh, I ended up finding that it was a bird dog camera that was killing us and flooding our network and bringing us our whole India infrastructure down, it was 16 channels of video and audio all going into a TriCaster TC1, and it was live to the world on broadcast TV. So is it reliable? Yes, I, I stake my reputation on it because it's what I use. Absolutely. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, just add, I'll just add to Jeff's point here. Most of the operators who have, or video engineers, right, who went to vMix to kind of stay in the game are now transitioning to TriCasters because the pixel quality is better, the, the in and outs are a little better, the ability of what you can do on it is just a little more easier for, and uh, a little more reliable than what vMix can be. Uh, I'll end it on that. Also, I want to jump to Benjamin here, who has a demonstration, I believe. Sure. So, um, so many of you know, Zoom OSC is working on, the folks at Liminal are working on Zoom OSC 4.0. And with that, a whole bunch of integrations are coming soon. I've got a little uh, beta companion integration. So um, many of you know, Bay Focus Companion allows uh, you to control a stream deck with uh, a variety of fancy functions. So right now I have my, oops, that's not the demo I wanted. I'll come back. There we go. Uh, so I have got a the Stream Deck buttons loaded up on my iPad here. So uh, you can see these buttons are all configured with your names, at least the panelists here. Oops, let's ignore that. Uh, and uh, so if I turn on the video of my Zoom NDI, or Zoom, sorry, Zoom OSC friend over there, you might be able to see it in the gallery view. Um, I'm going to switch my mic over there so you can all see that one a little easier. Okay. I can... Uh, so I can... My, I can do a multi-pin for you if you want. Oh, yeah. If you're up for a multi-pin, that'd be great. Yeah, Spotlight yeah. will um, complicate this demonstration. Yeah, stand by one. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Stand by one second. Let me set that up on the recorder machine so that Facebook will be able to see it, and then I'll get it going on. Do you want me to get a question in anyway? you set that up? Yeah, that'd be great. Of course. Yeah, so I got a question here from Eugene Palmer. Uh, and this might go to Roscoe, actually. What are the best environmental lighting conditions for virtual green screens? Backlights over the shoulder, sidelights for LED cards. That was it. Anytime you say green screen, the more even the lighting can be on the background, the better. And then uh, there's been a couple tips, and I forget the name of them right now, but there's a some paint that just seems to work better than others. And I think uh, I heard recently that it's because the IR reflection is absorbed. And that actually helps. So we'll see. Capital, what is the name of that paint? So if you're using paint, otherwise green is green. If it comes back to you, just let us know in the comments and we'll share it with the community out there. And uh, Ed, are we, are we good to go? Let me see. So uh, this is not what I was hoping for because the it's the webinar side. Without spotlighting you, it's tough, Benjamin, because the webinar will not see it properly. Okay, so, um, then uh, can you co-host the Zoom OSE and I can ignore the spotlight. Sure, that I can do. Great. Real quick, Benjamin put in the chat here and I'll move it over to Facebook of the, the best virtual, uh, about the silver balls for filming. There's a great video on YouTube that kind of explains the whole thing. So, yeah, oh, Fox we did a really great job. Yeah, we did post, we did share one, uh, great videos on silver balls for filming. Yeah, we did mm -hmm. share that to the Facebook community. Oh, you did? Okay, thank you. Yep. So if anybody was looking for that, uh, it is there. Um, it's posted by Omar Colomb. Um, there's no time step on it, but oh, nine minutes ago. Excellent. Let's. I got a quick question for Jeff. 
every time I see you on one of these, you're in what looks like one of your trailers. Are you just never sure home? <laughs> no. Or do you have this. one in your driveway that you just walk out to do these calls or what? Actually, literally, there is a, there is, uh, there's three of them sitting right there about 50 feet away. But no, I'm actually in my office. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we have a, a very long office, so it's a long hallway. And so that's why it's like right there behind me. Do you have the same carpet on the walls of your office as the trailers? No, th this isn't carpet. It's actually a textured uh, sheet rock. Oh, nice. Yeah. Looks yeah. good. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. So, Benjamin, do you, uh, you all set? We're, you should be co-hosting. I think we're all good. Yeah. So, if you, if you uh, spotlight the Zoom OSC of me, we can control a demonstration here. Zoom OSC of you. There we go. Okay. Excellent. So, um, oh, no, we're here's getting... the fun part. Oh. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get there in a second. So, um, let's not spot, uh, let's ignore that for a second. So, essentially, from my companion integration, I can spotlight uh, any, I can pin any one of you. And this is the really exciting part. So, just from here, I can tap on as many people as I'm interested in, and we can create super sources on the fly. Um, so, with the release of this, um, with the release of the companion uh, integration, the, the names will all update live on your tiles to match your gallery view. And you can also control speaker view versus gallery view um, and clear pins, and you can keep maneuvering around that way. So a good example might be, let's say I wanted to pin uh, me, and let's see, where am I on this one? I think I might be a little further away. Oops, oh. don't pin yourself, quick tip. But um, you can <laughs> Not see, when you're spotlighted, at least. At least not when you're spotlighted. Uh, this is a challenge with live demos. This is um, perfect. I think... So broadly speaking, this is kind of the, the closest you can get to a super source natively in Zoom. Um, and then with two of these, you could easily imagine how one of them you can have on just sitting on gallery. And then as you prepare the next super source on your other machine, um, you're just sitting here. And then when the super source is ready, let's say, you know, we had a couple people ready, then we can uh, vision mix to this one and cut, cut, to, cut from preview to program. Right. And it's important to note that you're doing that all on that uh, virtual stream deck on your iPad Correct. using Zoom yeah, OSC 4, which has just, just been released. Uh, a number of us on Office Hours are, are going through some training and learning how to use it. Um, I'll be bringing it into my workflow shortly, along with some other upgrades that I'm going to be making to my, my setup. Uh, but it's really something cool. Um, and the fact that one thing that we were talking to about today uh, in all this was the um, ability to pin to your second screen, multi-pin, as well as your Correct. your first screen. So from you, you know, you mentioned using two machines, but you could really use one machine, pin stuff, you know, uh, one super source to screen two, then pin a different super source to screen one, switch between your screens to whatever you're vision mixing with, and then flip it on the other side. So it's a uh, really powerful, yeah. cool stuff that's that's uh, here. The future is now, I should say. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's Zoom OSC. We did an episode with uh, Andy Carluccio uh, about a month ago, uh, beginning of this month. Yeah, I'm posting it in the comments now. Yeah, awesome. And like... a, a little clarification there. Uh, the second, second uh, screen pinning is not fully active in Zoom yet. Hopefully it will be someday soon. Gotcha, but presently, right. you can uh, multi-pin and multi-spotlight, uh, but nothing on the second screen yet. Although, oh, okay. an inv investigation to the API showed that the infrastructure is there that you need to enable the functionality. And it, in my understanding, it would be the second screen would have a completely, would not be able to move a pin from one screen to the other. So they would have to have completely new people on the second screen. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. This morning, on, I think it was this morning on Office Hours, Anthony said you um, would keep your gallery or your, you know, your host on that in a single. So you could cut to a single while you set up the next pin or cut to the gallery while you set up the next pin. Right. Uh, you or may have seen it screen. when he was building the six. You, you saw that there was a little bit of delay while, while the six one came up. And you want to hide that by being able to cut back to the gallery or to a single. Sure. Um, and one other little thing, if you uh, stop the spotlight on the Zoom OSC of me. Uh, okay, great. So back over here on the companion integration, you can see that um, right, I have this all configured for pin right now. But um, as a co-host, you can use the same functionality for spotlight. 
I've got the same controls here, just with different buttons for spell it. So uh, as a co-host, we can create a multi-spot as well. Um, right now, we are just using single spotlight though. And then you can unspotlight as well, same idea. Um, and then going back up, if you're interested more in turning people's videos on and off, let's say maybe more, more useful as a theater production, so those buttons exist as well, as well as mute and unmute. Um, so you can imagine the, the kind of options you have available here um, for, for controlling a larger Zoom call, at least with, uh, with your Stream Deck. And thus far, you have created that stream, that uh, companion layout because there isn't a native one uh, from BitFocus, but as you alluded to, there is one coming, correct? Yes, this was actually a uh, beta from Liminal, and hopefully one will be coming very soon. They're working on some more updates, uh, like some of the names you might notice don't quite match up with your gallery view right now, but um, coming soon, there should be uh, an official companion module to make this really seamless for end users. Great. Uh, That's awesome. Omar, Sorry. I see a couple of questions on Zoom. Do you want to you wanna grab one or two of those? Oh, yeah. So I got one uh, from Eugene Palmer again, right? This is great, but if the goal is to bring all participants into a common background, such as a forest or a beach, what background and lighting would best support that? So uh, I think yeah, the question I... is, well, uh, it depends on what you would want to make sure. That's a multi-tiered question, actually. So, <laughs> uh, with if everyone was running Zoom OSC Pro, you would be able to switch everyone's backgrounds at the same time uh, with using their virtual backgrounds uh, with remote commands from one place. For example, um, another way you could do that is if everyone had a green screen that was evenly lit, you might be able to do something with keying um, coming into a vision mixer, but um maybe uh benjamin you can maybe talk more about the the backgrounds i know andy has talked much about it but maybe you can share a little if you know anything or sure. have something to um, add mm -hmm. so one of the key features of zoom osc pro is that uh you can remote control other uh, zoom osc clients so they don't need the pro license um uh, pro licenses will be coming will be forthcoming uh, and they will allow you to remote control any free clients. So if your talent is using Zoom OSC, it's just like Zoom client, just with a couple extra functionalities, they'll and they enable uh, remote control via chat. Um, your client can uh, set their virtual backgrounds and read a list of their virtual backgrounds as well. So uh, let's say you send every talent a, a package of 10 backgrounds that they load in, um, you could set them all simultaneously and create a really neat effect. And yeah, you said they don't have to have pro on the controlling end, the remote end? Yes, exactly. So on the talent, as, as far as I know, this is something we should check with uh, Liminal and Andy, but I believe the only the control, only the computer giving out the controlling signals requires the pro license and any, uh, any clients receiving the signals do not require the pro version. Hmm. I was, I was under the impression, the same impression Dave was that everyone had to have pro to control, but we, uh, we can ask Andy, and we will uh, we'll get back to you guys for sure in the Discord. We'll, uh, Andy is actually part of the Discord, so uh, if you guys want to ask there, we can absolutely uh, try to clarify that for you. So yeah, um, and I, I, I want to throw in there real quick. I felt like the question was more of a it's like a streamyard thing where you have pictures. Let's say let's say this was here instead of this black background in the gather set, it would be some kind of static image or something, right? Is is that what you're trying to ask, Eugene? I think they're trying to do uh, what do you call it? A uh, uh, mosaic where you all have a corner section of a larger image, right. and then yeah, they've the been doing that with theater. It looks like a big viewpoint from that's behind. what it seems. You would like. have to. Andy would know the scale of where the location of each of these grids are at a twenty-five by twenty-five or on a twenty-five grid. So he would know the exact dimensions of these boxes. He's gotten them from Zoom already. If we knew the size of those at that scale, you could do a background screen and then have somebody make a screen the full size of those all added together and then cut off each little section of that and send it to someone and have them use it as a virtual background yeah they've they've done that uh but to omar's question uh, and and based on eugene's follow-up questions he asked to have a uh, he asked benjamin to put us all on the same beach um sadly right now we're not all running zoom osc so we wouldn't be able to to do that uh as a live demo 
But uh, I, I think what Leland was saying as the mosaic is what he's going for. But to what Omar was saying, um, I did ask Andy about that uh, in a conversation and changing the, uh, in a gallery view, the black background was not something that Zoom OSC was going to support from what I recall. Roscoe? So imagine that you're a high school and you buy the Zoom OSC version of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. All the actors have to do is sign in with the name of their character. They will be properly placed in the right place on the screen. Their background will be properly changed as each scene comes through. And they will have a finished Zoom production of Twelfth Night without a lot of work on their end. As Has there been any talk on pricing for the... $40. 40. Oh, Jeez, for money. Money. For month. Thir yeah, I heard thirty-five. I heard thirty-five a month as well. For actually, pro today. Yeah, I saw Benjamin shake his head. No. Correct. The 30, 35 a month. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, well, that's brilliant. Um, now, Roscoe, as amazing as that does sound, uh, I don't want to imagine it because I'm hoping that we will be back to doing in-person okay. events at Let some me point. Back up. School teacher has the same class come in every day. Johnny always gets to sit in the corner, the same corner. Susie's in that corner. My class is laid out the same way. And as I go through different subjects, different things happen and the people are in by their names. They're tracked by their names. That's one of the powerful things is that he tracks by names, not by some random number. Right, which is great. Uh, it has the ability to track by a number. That's the whole thing. It's so super flexible. You can really tune it to the way you want to use it. Um, so Benjamin, thank you for bringing that demo, uh, and showing that to some people, you know, we did have that, uh, have Andy here, but that was on 3.2 and he foreshadowed some of those, uh, uh, zoom OSC version four features, but, uh, seeing them in practice is a, a very different thing. So thank you very much for that. Um, he's posting like them in the discord, like little things that people are talking about right now about tiling images and things. So if you're in the discord, you're getting to see that right now. Cool. But don't leave. Stick <laughs> around and, and the Discord will be there. You can you can go check it out uh, when we're done. Uh, but actually tonight, you're going to want to make sure you check out office hours when we're done, because tonight is the first Monday night office hours session. Um, it's a test that they're doing. I'm actually going to post a link to the office hours YouTube, and that's where you can find their links uh, if you wanted to join. Um, their webinar. They have links posted in the descriptions of all their videos. Uh, you can register for that. Tonight's the first night that they'll be doing uh, a Monday night. They're going to try it out for the next few weeks. Um, and thankfully, there was no scheduling conflict. So as me, as soon as we're done, they're going to open their session and we'll be able to, uh, to head on over and, and spend more time talking about uh, gear and and production and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, with that, does anyone on the panel, I would love to bring up the panel. Uh, anybody have something? Iris, I see your hand up. I have a question for Justin Butler. I want to know what he was doing with the lower thirds earlier. <laughs> that kept popping up on his screen. I missed that. I missed the lower thirds. What were you, uh, what'd you have going on, Justin? It's just vMix. I'm running myself through vMix and then back out to Zoom. Uh, so oh, that's test, interesting. Are you testing out the uh, the pre-built lower thirds? Yeah, there you go. Hold on, let me uh, let me get him spotlighted real quick so we can. We can it's just it. some of the the basic ones, um, some of the animated ones. Just drop in and out. Can I ask you, Justin, what kind of camera you're using? We need to get my your camera. It's there. a Logitech Stream Cam. Okay. Um, try one thing you'd like to try to get rid of. There are those pillars that are on either side of your camera. If you double click yeah, your no, camera I, source, I usually don't have that. It's just I got home like right before we started might all be able this. To help kind you of real quick and show you how to do it. If you double click the camera on. source on VMix there, where your camera's coming in, just double click it, and on the general section at the very top, you'll see the name of your webcam, and right below it, it says aspect ratio. It's a little pull down. Select widescreen or source, and you should be able to fill your screen. One of the other. Yeah, I usually don't have any problem with it. I don't know why it was doing this uh, tonight. Uh, probably they can because do that I'm with using, driver uh, updates sometimes. It depends. I'm using a blank show because the show I'm working on, I didn't open it. So 
I just oh, threw I inputs in there really fast. So I didn't really pay attention to, but yeah, I, I saw it that my camera and it's just, I, I thought maybe you were coming in on a phone tonight. It's only the one coming in through, it's only coming in through, uh, NDI. Cause if I switch it to, if I switch it to the camera that's in my machine running it, it's the right aspect, which is me yeah, gotcha. coming across the room. So oh, that, that computer setup you had there. What's that? Oh, that's, that's what I take on the road for virtuals. It's not nice. all set up right now, but it's just. So, so Leland, I, I got one for you here from Mike Gray, Grayib. I'm probably saying that wrong, but uh, so client has asked me to do the switch in a Zoom webinar a few in a few weeks. Two hosts and one guest in the webinar. I want to bring all three into the webinar by vMix call into Zoom, but client wants the whole thing done inside of Zoom so that hosts can see audience questions in real time. Should I just let Zoom do the switching between the three? No reason for the spotlight on the fly, right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a logistics call either way you do it. I would probably say if you want to get questions to your talent, simply port the questions from the other call. You can either do it with a text message or you could send it into the chat of the, the vMix or you can use an interface like Google Slides that has a Q&A interface where you could simply have a link that people could push on the link, enter their question and have it broadcast through the browser and then have the browser displayed somewhere on the scene uh, within the mix that you do so that they can see the question come up as maybe a lower third type display. I would highly recommend that. The only other way to really pull it off is to broadcast a Zoom into a Zoom and then do a lot of routing with the mix minus on the audio so that you have them talking inside each other. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, uh, I was just going to add, you know, if uh, you're doing the vision mixing within uh, capturing within the same Zoom webinar that you're feeding it out of, you're going to be dealing with the audio uh, sync issues. It, it won't be in sync. So if you're going to do a repack like that, like Leland just said, have a separate Zoom meeting that you pump in and then send return feed back. And you can always do a screen scrape of the, the Q&A window if you were going to do something like that. Uh, but maybe look at Zoom OSC like Benjamin just showed us and do the switching on the fly if you want. You won't get the lower thirds um, unless, well, we've looked at things with lower thirds, but again, that would be the same kind of thing. You'd have to capture something and, and do a full repack into the webinar because the audio is always the, uh, the concern. Yeah, there are other tricky ways to do and build out lower thirds within Zoom where you're routing the video that's literally right there in a multi frame where you're stacking lower thirds into scrapes of the video from the Zoom. I've done it. It's, it's a little more intricate process. It's where you're basically building out each source, each individual from a scrape of the big screen. And then you're covering that with a template. So you're putting the branding or whatever over top of the windows. So anything you're doing behind isn't really seen. Um, that gives you the ability to pull others in and then slap lower thirds on them. So it's it, by using vMix, you can use the multi-layer inputs that you're given to add extra elements to those. So it, it's really a matter of choice how you do it, um, but there are workarounds. And Lila, why we got your attention for a second, Lars Svensson, I hope I say that right, uh, is asks, he's asking you directly, where is Lila located? He has a cool dialect. I'm located in the, let's, let's do it the way that we Northerners do it. I'm right here in the state of Michigan, located centrally. Been here all my life since I was born. So, uh, but I am, my parents were brought over here by grandparents back in the early 1900s. So it's one of those, I should say, my grandparents were brought here by their parents in the 1900s. And it's been a very rural type of environment that I've lived in, a little bit hillbilly redneck, you might say. So in the Amish? That's the, the yeah, there's in a lot the of Amish in the, yeah. yes, a lot of Amish yeah. in the All thumb of Michigan. Way. Yep, yes. And then Justin Butler, before I go on to my next thing, it seems like you fixed it. What was the, what was the solve? Uh, NDI scan converter was uh, letterboxing me for some reason. It wasn't picking up. I had a full HD webcam for some reason. Got it. Got it. That was quick. Oh, that was quick, man. I like it. I like it. That's what, that's right. the power of the hive mind. Yep. So I got one more here. Uh, 
I'm sorry, Benjamin, go ahead. Just really quickly on a quick error correct, uh, Andy corrected me. You need uh, Zoom OSC Pro for both sides of the connection if you want to control virtual backgrounds or cameras. Thanks for the correction. Cool, cool. And, and stepping back to that um, that discussion about the Q&A and webinar, if you use a hardware switcher like a you know a regular black magic in multiple computers, you can get you know just one frame off and then just pin your output of your switcher and you can you know use this the ATEM to do the lower thirds and things like that. Um, they're not as fancy, you know, sometimes as the the vMix ones packaged, but you can also feed vMix into an ATEM with cut and fill. Mm -hmm. And um, that way you're not passing the video signal through vMix in the call. Um, and you're only losing a frame, you know, of latency going through the ATEM. But you're using vMix to do all the lower thirds. And I, and I got one more here, uh, and this might be for Benjamin directly. Uh, Jeff Woodgren, who, you know, the brainchild behind uh, the Zoom Test Kitchen, asks, does Zoom OSC allow you to turn on and turn off participants' cameras? Indeed it does. Um, if you, it will be a auto, it'll just turn, turn you off if you send a stop video command. But if you want to turn somebody on, it will uh, require their permission. If they are running any version of Zoom OSC, it'll automatically accept that prompt. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. So uh, uh, I I'll just, yeah, oh, sorry, go on, just go last on, bit go on that is you can do mute and unmute as well uh, of audio. And any, uh, if you ask for permission to automatically or to, to unmute people at will, uh, that'll work really well. So awesome, awesome. So just, just letting everybody know out there, we got about 15 minutes left on the clock, about 16 to be exact, uh, left on the clock. So if you have any questions for us, you haven't answered yet. If you missed one of your questions, please post it in the comments and we'll, we'll bring it back up. Uh, and I apologize for missing it. If you have any future things you want to talk about, any kind of products or demos or anything that we haven't covered before already within the Facebook side, uh, let us know. We can always circle back. To, uh, we're always trying to find new things and get things. This, this open forum was specifically made to talk to you guys in uh, person again, not just be so much of a show and tell, uh, kind of go back to our roots a little bit and what we used to do. Uh, obviously, we, this has been a fun and engaging conversation, but I want to make sure we stay on time. Uh, I have another call tomorrow. I don't know what everybody else is doing, but I, you know, I, I try to stay us on time. So uh, right. again, 15 minutes left on the clock. If anybody, if we've missed anything, bring it up. Um, if you haven't asked it, ask now. And uh, if there's anything we haven't covered yet that you want us to cover or that you think we haven't covered, let us know. And if, if we bring it up and we have covered it, we'll post it in the chat so you guys can get back to it. Um, that's all I got. I see, uh, I see John's hand. With, uh, what do you got, John? Well, just a question. Uh, our conference center is looking into or close to uh, switching to becoming a virtual studio for events. And we've got a good, you know, mix of people from across the country who've worked with various uh, convention centers. So what are your convention centers doing in terms of setting up spaces to be used for virtual events versus uh, hopefully that they'll get back to their normal face-to-face? So I, I could talk in the Florida market, in South Florida in particular, uh, some of the smaller bar rooms are being converted to uh, like, like uh, actually perfectly for our conversation. So like we were saying earlier about virtual sets, the, the, the best solve is to have an actual set. So a lot of companies down here are partnering with hotels and they're building sets in the smaller ballrooms and offering the service. If you want to go virtual, everything is here. There's a set here for you. There's, a, there's gear here for you. And they're doing partnerships with local AV companies. That's been kind of big down here. I've been seeing also uh, in Orlando before I came to Texas just now, we did a hybrid event and we had a virtual team off to the side, actually in front, doing kind of more of like a, I would say like a broadcast type of thing where they had a uh, uh, MC and a host, they would interact as the show was going on and sit, you know do commentary uh, with a, a line cut from us from the backstage of our eight cameras that were going uh, for the stage um, for a church event. And they switched on the live side between that and between intermissions and like that. So they, they got audience have engaged. It kind of had like an esports vibe to it, the way they, they kind of handled that. I see that coming around a lot more. Um, those are kind of the two things I've seen as far as that goes. Jeff, I'll let you, I'll let you take the floor. I think where the the future I've been watching uh, is uh, Unreal on LED walls behind and creating volumes. It's just so simple to do virtual production. Well, I say simple. It's not like it used to be. You don't have to build things, but if you have the ability and the budget, LED volume is the way to go because then you have whatever you want up 
at that point. Whatever background, it's not a green screen. It literally is the background with the Unreal Engine running it uh, and the new tracking camera capabilities that they have. I mean, it's just, I, my mind just is blown by looking at it and uh, I can't wait to get my hands deeper into it for sure. And we and must Nick's be close on time. Be, Nick's supposed to be back at office hours here soon as well to go through more Unreal Engine trainings, you might say, or know-how because he's got it all over there at the university. Dave, you had you got something? Yeah, I just got a call from um, the local Hilton, and um, they are that Hilton has put together a network of hybrid and virtual event ready hotels. So Hilton is going out and speed testing all their hotel internet for virtual events, and they reached out to us to say, you know, here in our market, local market, and what other other markets we serve, um, can you support our hotels? We want a list of this gear that we can provide to clients to come in and do virtual meetings. Go ahead, Roscoe. Uh, Academia is going the same way. Our 400 seat theater is now a television production studio. If you want to put it in those terms, we're taking it has a fly space and we are actually using it, but it's uh, we're we're building sets pulling them in, filming on them. And now we also have a thrust stage. It's now going to be the dance filming studio. And then we have a four-sided uh, four stage, and it's now going to be a showcase studio. So all of our large theater spaces, because they're large, are becoming uh, COVID-friendly production spaces for video. Iris, did you have anything we hope, on the we, we hope to go back. On the theater side, I've heard some rumors that theaters are kind of incorporating the live side for their plays. Um, actually, some of them are, uh, like they were talking about the match Zoom backgrounds before. They're, some of them are doing all virtual, where they're sending them the pe their piece of the set, which is a virtual background, and parking them in there and then mosaicing them. And some of them, they're doing the actual onstage production, but they're bringing in, like, um, Hillsborough Community College did their theater on theater, but then the television production department came with the cameras, and they streamed it and there was no live audience. And so that's how theaters, some of them are doing hybrid anyway, uh, those who can. Um, others are full virtual production. It really depends on what they're trying to do. Some have limited audience. It really depends on the theater and their space. Black boxes and, are the hardest because they're small. So. Yeah, I was just gonna speak to um, what's going on with a lot of theater here in New York. There's a lot of um, the industry is having a hard time moving forward because of uh, union conflicts between um, SAG and uh, Actors Equity. So there's stage, and then there's you know screen and broadcast, and there, there there's some territorial dispute. So the industry is having a hard time moving forward. But I've been working with some individual producers from people who are producing play, you know doing basically one hand or single person plays in their apartments and trying to help them integrate. OBS with companion, get a little bit of control so they can do multi-camera and do some effects. And it, it's incredible. This uh, isn't, you know, a lot of young people are taking to the cinematic quality of, uh, of doing things that are written for stage and bringing it into a virtual space. Uh, it, it's fun seeing how that's like, uh, you know, triggering imagination uh, for, for a lot of us on the tech side that we're seeing how the tools can, can uh, sort of add new opportunities. And on, on the talent side, a lot of people are coming up with new stories and new ways to uh, interact with each other. I, I like what you just said there. And I wrote it down, triggering animation, triggering of animation that, that that's like resonates with what, everything going on in this industry right now. Nina, I saw you shaking your head. Do you have anything in comparison? Uh, yeah, just sort of thinking about what theaters are doing. I've seen a lot of theaters switch to doing audio dramas. So they'll remount um, previous productions, but in an audio setting. So just basically doing a radio play. So there's a lot of sort of opportunities and different um, versions for how theaters are trying to continue on into the near and not so near future. Now, Brent, now that you just said that, I want to write a radio play that's made to be done on zoom like the actors dress up like the uh, period piece it, thing it's been done it has yeah, been done well, well then done. i'm behind Dang. <laughs> <laughs> can i just make one statement the tech students really feel like they're being shortchanged a little bit in all this 
because the set designs that they would have been able to do, they're not able to do because we just don't have the labor to build them. And the lighting people feel like really, you know, they, they want flat and white and they really don't want to, you know, put a lot of effects into the lighting because we have to make it perfect for the video camera. And so that's been a real frustration. And But at the same time, they are embracing a new medium. And so they are stretching what they learn. I happen to sit 30 miles from Hollywood. So a lot of our graduates are going to get jobs in the film industry or they're going to head that direction. So which is good, but... Anyway. I think when a lot of theaters incorporate live elements, there's going to be cameras, there's going to be new opportunities, and there's going to be a whole industry of traditional theater workers who don't know how to use any of that, and people coming out of school who can learn from this uh, sea change and be ready to integrate those technologies. I think we'll have a, a good opportunity in the next uh, year or two. Um, right. Justin right. Hermingaus, can maybe you speak, since you're in both the theater and education space, can you uh, weigh in a little here too? Um. Boy, I don't know what to add. I think our belts has covered it so much. I mean, I got to tell you, my big thing sitting here listening tonight is like, I've been doing this for a bunch of years. You know, I watched us go from manual lighting to computer lighting, from analog consoles to, you know, the, oh, those digital ones will never come on, to the move to IP video and IP audio. But, I mean, we're, what, coming up on a year in this pandemic? And just the the revolutionary pace of the way people are modifying workflows and adapting this and coming up with new art forms and shifting the corporate model. I mean, literally, we're watching things revolutionized in time, sp time spans countered in weeks at this point. And you listen to this every week, and that's just so striking, the things people are innovating and how fast it's happening. And over to Jeff. <laughs> The part I don't understand is I do watch news in the morning. The news people have yet to understand that they could buy a microphone, they could buy a light kit, and they could be better. L watch the morning news, and, and anybody that's in this industry that, that's used to producing something, it, it just makes me cringe in the morning to the point that I've got to where I just, I just turn it off. Just this morning, girl sitting there on a laptop, and it's down here, so you're seeing her look down at it. No microphone. All you hear is echo in the room. And and the person that was actually the host, you could hear perfectly clear. She was in the studio, but it irritates me to no end that they literally or it's like they don't even try. And I don't understand that. I watch the same things happen with whether it's news media or other sources that do it, and it's like, all right, I'm. I'm a little streamer and I look better than you and you're a freaking professional news studio and you look like a bunch of Muppets rolling rolling around. It's like, are you kidding me? I've got a webcam, a mic, a ring light, and some RGB and I can do it better than you. Uh, Brent, you're did you have something to add? Billion dollar studio. Um, no, going back to how we, everybody's transition venues and whatnot, so we've basically converted our entire warehouse in Toronto to uh, three virtual stages, one with a huge 180 degree LED wall, um, with Unreal Engine, as Jeff was talking about earlier, it's awesome with the motion capturing and camera directing. Um, and then just six other spaces that are just control rooms. So we we really are scared of kind of go back on site almost because we're sort of enjoying what we're doing just in the venue that is our office now. So, so where is this I need to come to work? Uh, Toronto, Canada. <laughs> Sorry, it's pretty awesome. I'm trying to get permission to take you guys all on a virtual tour of that. Hopefully, that's coming soon. Yeah, and, and for us, know I don't know if people heard about a, a little merger that happened between you know some major players in North yes. America. But you know, we we are looking at eventually combining our resources and not having multiple warehouses and multiple operations teams. But at the moment, you know, we have so much control because we know our bandwidth, we know what we can do. And honestly, mm -hmm. just go walk over to a shelf, grab a laptop. Okay, we need to add a Zoom breakout. Here we go. We're done. Exactly. Um, it's just down <laughs> the, the, the aisle way. So I you think guys be... uh, have some YouTube videos, like demo videos, that studio that are spectacular. I do, uh, and I can share the link with Ed that he could put out to people. Yeah. I think I it's going to be interesting when we can combine the virtual studio in Orlando with the one in Canada. 
since it's all one company now, everybody's one happy umbrella. Mm -hmm. And just from wherever it is, because they are building those stages in various spots. So it'll be interesting when it all combines to together. Make them all look the same so that a presenter in Orlando and yep. a presenter in New York or a presenter in Toronto all can look like they're in the same environment, but not to be. So I just, I, sorry, guys, I just got to jump in there. We got three minutes left on the clock. I just want to end, end it on a little positive note here. Uh, some positive feedback I usually give to the speaker that's with us that we got for the community. But Chuck Wigga said, nice, Jeff, excited to test. Uh, Adam Pitts said, great job. Rico DeSantis said, I never, I'm never giving up an OBS. Uh, Louis Torres said, wow, nice. Uh, uh, Paul said, Benjamin is the man. Um, what else did we have here? I had a couple other ones real quick uh, of a positive note. Uh, Louis Torres, hybrid is here to stay. Rocco DeSantis, I'm teaching, oh, here you go. I'm teaching virtual theater at Mermont, and we are having the lighting designers design real and virtual lighting that is applied live. And Ed, just so you know, there's already 100 people who have done this idea of yours. So get in line, brother. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Uh, I, no original ideas here. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you guys for joining us tonight. I thank the, thank the panel for such a great talk. Um, thank all of you for the questions today. Uh, I posted a link to next week's episode, which is going to be uh, Zoom meetings, tips, tricks, and new features review. So um, please, uh, you know, if you're on Facebook, check out the event page for more information and make sure uh, if you're already registered for the Zoom webinar, I'm going to try to make it as seamly as possible uh, to get you over there. But you can always re-register. I dropped the link in the chat here on Zoom. I just dropped the chat, uh, the link in the chat on Facebook. And again, the new 1080p webinar Full HD, so attendees will get full 1080p, is uh, thanks to the continued support from the DVE store. Uh, I see Guy Cochran is, is uh, hanging out with us tonight. Uh, appreciate everything. I just bought a, a new vMix license from them the other day. They're super great to work with. Um, we love everything they do for us. Um, so go to visit them over at dvestore.com. I posted that link for you guys in the chats as well. Uh, and we are going to make sure we end on time tonight because it is, as I mentioned earlier, the first uh, office hours Monday night meeting. And we have a lot of crossover in our um, our viewing audience and our panelists. So uh, we're glad that we could make it work out with no scheduling conflicts. We really appreciate Alex uh, working around our schedule and uh, and doing something so great Uh and the reason there is an office hours in the evening is for those people on parts of the globe where uh, their normal morning sessions are just not conducive. Um, so that'll be great. You can go right from here to there. Uh, I just posted uh, their YouTube link. You can from there you can get the links to uh, to join and register. Um, Bodhi, if you have, if you in thirty seconds, if you can tell us about your charity thing, then that'll close us out for the night. All right, I'm going to post it on Facebook and into the chats here. Most of you guys have been around. I have seen a lot of you come around, which I greatly appreciate. Twitch.tv backslash Talks of Firewolf. I do live streams every day, Monday through Friday, 8 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, yeah, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Let me call clarify that. Uh, and Wednesday, Friday nights. We are going to be starting a D&D &D campaign next Friday for all you freaks and geeks out there that enjoy role-playing and D&D and all that good fun stuff. I am playing a Jensei water druid. Uh, so, and we're going to be finalizing all that this week. So everybody that stopped by and showed love on my 24 hour stream in here, I greatly appreciate and love every single one of you. Yeah. You streamed for, you streamed for 24 hours, 24 hours straight. I showed up at like 3 AM to keep 3 make sure he was still awake. <laughs> I had a couple people coming and go, you're still alive. Yeah. I'm still good. We're, we're rolling. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. So, Made $650 for the kids that night, by the way. That's Woo! what it was all about. All right. Yeah. Great job. Well, that's that's awesome, man. It, it's great that you keep doing this. And uh, it's it's awesome that the community is is joining in. Leland, uh, I think it was Leland who said he watched. Was that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, that was, community I, supporting. Playing Star Wars Battlefront 2 when he came in. Cool. I was the, sniping, I was sniping uh, uh, the evil empire at that point. Awesome. Well, again, thank you to, to all the panelists. Thank you, Omar and Chris. Uh, thank you, Andy, Leland, Nina, Roscoe, Jeff, Justin Hermminghouse, Dave Node, Adam, 
Nat, Disa, Iris, Justin Butler, Brent, and John Edelson. And thanks to Ben, he had to run and, and have dinner. Uh, for those who don't know, Ben is only 18 and in high school. So uh, if you weren't impressed before, you should be now. So with that, I want to thank Starting you all. Starting a busy war on hiring him. Yeah. Or getting him to your college. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, Roscoe is already drafting the uh, acceptance letter. So thank you, guys, if he has that kind of pull. So thank you very much. Have a good night. Uh, we'll see uh, some of you guys over at Office Hours, and we'll definitely see you guys next week. Thanks a lot.